Many popular DAC amps appear to use the identical ESS chips, the same XMOS USB interfaces, and similar switch mode power supplies, resulting in undistinguishable sound. The SMSL RAW MDA1 may seem similar on paper, but it is completely different in practice. Please leave a like and let's get to it. This unit stands out compared to similarly priced options from SMSL, as it offers a distinctively more premium feel. While the enclosure is made from a rather thin metal sheet, common in this price range, what I found particularly interesting is the considerable weight increase for some reason. This heft makes for the density that contributes to an overall impression of quality and sturdiness. It's important to note that it is not the most luxurious construction on the market. Examining the RAW MD1 closely, you will notice that its front plate is not only thicker than its sides, but also extends beyond the body in all directions. This design choice imparts a modern aesthetic that avoids the conventional squared off box look. Instead, this unit's profile represents an appearance that fits well within a variety of setups. It holds a high-resolution, colorful LCD display protected by tempered glass, which enhances scratch resistance and durability. Next to the screen you'll find a rotary, stepped digital knob that allows for intuitive control over the DAC, including volume adjustment and changing the internal settings. While it looks almost identical to one on, for example, the D0100 Pro, it's designed with a bit more finesse. It has a firmer feel, minimizing wobbling, and it responds with satisfying, more tactile feedback. Unfortunately, it seems a bit less accurate, as the rapid volume adjustments can be unpredictable at times. At the bottom of the unit, four rubber feet provide elevation, which can help with ventilation to prevent heat buildup. These feet also keep the device from sliding on a desk. Nevertheless, I very much appreciate the simplistic design, as it simply works. If you have watched this video so far, you can consider subscribing to my channel. The choices made regarding the I.O. are rather uncommon and pretty unique. We can feed the digital data using one of two coaxial RCA inputs, one of two optical Toslink connectors, wirelessly through Bluetooth or by connecting a USB-C cable. I have no idea why they went for this doubling standards instead of replacing one coax with, for example, BNC, and the second optical with perhaps a yes. Let me know your thoughts on this topic in the comments. It is powered by a regular C16 power cable with a power switch on the back. It also comes with a required cable in the box. For the outputs, it makes more sense. On the back, we have direct DAC outs, a pair of balanced XLRs, and single-ended RCAs in the middle. This is a balanced DAC, and I found that it performed better in the XLR mode. The RCA was not massively worse, but it lost some dynamics, detail and stage width. On the front we have headphone outputs. They go through both the DAC and the headphone amplifier section. They come in two flavors. Desktop size, quarter inch jack, as well as 4.4mm. I'm not sure if the amp section is also balanced, because both sounded pretty similar. As always with SMSL products, it's packed with features, functions and some extra gimmicks. For those title users, it supports MQ8 decoding and MQACD file formats. I have my true lossless library that is not, like MQA, close to the original recording. It is the original recording with uncompressed-like quality. This DAC has two of the latest ESS chips, the ES9039Q2M. They are in a configuration that I would assume to be dual mono, so one separate chip per channel. This increases the channel separation, as the signal from one chip doesn't bleed to the other. Additionally, this slightly lowers the distortion and improves the synod. The well-known Exmos XU316 is being used as a digital interface. Not a surprise. It can work with PCM, DSD and DOP files. So, no matter what you throw at it, it can handle that. This is an honestly very very good measuring unit. Both the dynamic range and the THD plus N are the same. The XLR outputs have an impressive 132 decibels. 
with RCA outputs at 127 decibels and a headphone output at 122 decibels. There are different types of distortions, harmonics and overtones, and it all adds up to the final sound. The line output levels are slightly above the standard ones, with 5.2V for the XLR, 2.5V RMS for RCA and 8.2V RMS for headphone outputs. These amplitude levels suggest high gain for the DAC section, so driving external amplifiers is on one hand going to be easier, as gain shouldn't be that much of a problem, but on the other hand you have to be careful and mindful of clipping the signal with some amps. Higher voltage outputs, such as those from the XLRs, will provide a greater dynamic range and headroom. The headphone output delivers 2.5 watts per channel for 16 ohms and 1.7 watts per channel for standard 32 ohm loads. This power rating means that a wide range of headphones can be driven. I wouldn't trust it as much to drive a Susvara, HE6 or Tungsten with it, but regular headphones should be driven pretty optimally. For PCM it supports a maximum of 768kHz at 32-bit. For direct stream digital, DSD-512 is the limit. If you think it sounds the same as every other ESS DAC, you're mistaken. It is even unlike other SMSL chip-based DACs. Even the tonality is not a dead neutral flat line that you might be expecting here. Instead, it provides a warmer, but not tube-like experience. It still sounds like a digital device, which isn't something bad in particular, but it has that warmth with even no sound color settings. The bass is typical for any solid-state electronics, meaning well-extended, clean and pretty, but not the most dynamic. I sometimes wanted to get a bit more slam, along with a concentrated punch, but hey, it still beats most of the tube-based designs. In the mid-range, what's interesting, I perceive significantly more energy. There is more mid-range than any other frequency spectrum, making it sound a little forward in these registers. It didn't overdo that part though, so don't worry about excessive mids or unwanted forwardness in this range. I think it's a great match to slightly V-shaped transducers that are lacking in the mid-range, as it can fill it in. The treble performance is reasonable for the price. It offers good extension and some sparkle on top, but not sharpness. It has a bit of that stereotypical digital glare above around 13 kHz or so. However, it is not that easily noticeable. You have to listen for it. The resolution is more or less within my expectations. It does not go above and beyond to throw the micro details at you. Despite that, I never felt like it was veiled in any way, shape or form. The soundstage is very flexible and elastic in its presentation. It can be super close, narrow and intimate when needed with, for example, Billie Eilish vocals. Whereas in large-scale, epic orchestral symphonies, it can immediately expand beyond its boundaries. Of course, it won't get the typical tube gear width or a good R2 R2 duck size. No amount of added artificial harmonics can do that. Those technologies are simply better if you want to achieve the ultimate width. But with that dual mono configuration, it gets pretty close. It doesn't sacrifice any imaging precision to do it, as the individual sounds are very well separated without the feeling of being stretched laterally to achieve wider staging. What's more, this device is silent in terms of noise. It doesn't produce any high frequency hiss or transformer DC hum. Well, a part of that could be that it doesn't use a transformer, but the other part is a competent design with no ground loops. So, is it a good product? Sure, but you have to keep in mind its tonality and the extra mid-range. On some gear it might not be desirable, while on others it can be exactly what you're looking for.